So we got the attitude instrument. Okay, that one. And think of it as the blue is sky, the black is, is ground, and you'll see it, it turn in accordance with the horizon outside. Brad, once you're gonna, we're gonna line you up on the runway. I feel like you should take off. I feel like I feel, I feel like, like you should do it. You got the <laughs> flight suit. <laughs> I got the. I wore the wrong clothes. They're coming up on 60. All right, we go. Start pulling back. We're flying. Oh no! Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay, do you? Okay, you should do this. All right, just, just you should do this. I've got it. Okay, just I'll just keep my hands here, but you should definitely be doing this. Oh, okay, oh, okay. All right, we're good. I'm not. I'm fine. This is fine. People do this every day. You do this every day. This is your job, and we're fine with that. There's lots of things you can do in an airplane to hurt yourself. Yeah. And so we want to keep you within the guidelines of what the airplane's designed for and what your ability is. I'm comfortable, after 20 years of flying, to turn the airplane like this. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Yep. On the other hand, you're at a stage where you're comfortable to turn the airplane like this. That's my favorite. Yep, right there. That's a good turn. I'm sweating so much. <laughs> so go ahead and start turning it this way. Uh -huh. And let's just, uh, here, we'll, uh, uh, we'll get it so it's, the airplane is not really doing what you want it to. So okay, it's, well, it's already there. Yep. We're descending. We're in a turn. Uh -huh. And you're not comfortable. Yeah, no. My airplane. Okay, yep, yep, yep. yep. Tell you, I'm submitting fully to your authority. That sweat is dripping down my brow. No rebellion here. No rebellion. You guys, uh, you guys remember Brad? He was, he was a good guy. No, I'm just kidding. He survived. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm one of the pastors around here. We're glad you're with us as we use the analogy of an airplane. See, in the same way for an airplane, your attitude will affect your altitude in life. It affects the direction and the quality of your life, whether you're going to arrive or, or be in the direction that God's sending you or wandering off in the wrong places. In fact, Worst case scenario, you can crash and burn, and this attitude stuff is important for us to dig into and to learn from. This actually comes from a book called Lord, Change My Attitude Before It's Too Late. And so if, if this topic kind of like you're like, man, I need to learn a lot more, read this book. Uh, just side note, it's a terrible gift to give, so don't give it to anyone. <laughs> There's no way to give it to them and it not be backhanded. So this is for you. In fact, let's just start there. We all have a bad habit of when we get in situations like this and we talk about topics like this that we think of all the people in our life who this applies to. This is not about them today. It's about you. It's about what God wants to talk to you about with your attitude in your life, all right? So, so uh, I want you to focus in here because I'm gonna need you to kind of buckle up with me today. Uh, figuratively, we don't have real seat belts for you. Um, but, but we're gonna dig into a topic that's tough. And, and there, is, there is no way for us to do this topic justice without kind of hitting it in very broad strokes with the theological truths we see from God. It will not be as specific as some of you will want to answer all of the questions that you have. So if you have a Bible, I want you to open it to two parts of the Bible with me. The first is way at the beginning in the Old Testament or Old Covenant God had with his people to the book of Numbers, chapter 16. And then flip to the extreme, almost other side of the Bible, to the New Testament or the New Covenant for those who live in response to Jesus, to a book called 1 Peter chapter two. We, just like last week, are going to center ourselves on an attitude problem that comes from a story in the Old Testament and then hear what the New Testament Jesus followers say we need to do in response. Okay, so just like last week, if you're here, if you missed it, you gotta catch up. We kinda laid the groundwork. But the, this story from the Old Testament in Numbers is not just any story. It's, it's known as the story of the Exodus. It's the central story to the Jewish faith and understanding much of what happens through the Old Testament. And even if you're new to church, you probably know you're kind of familiar with some of the parts. It's Moses, Pharaoh, let my people go, parting Red Seas, wandering in deserts for 40 years, Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments. All that stuff is the Exodus story, and it's celebrated every year in the Jewish faith in a festival called the Passover. Now, by contrast, for followers of Jesus, the center of our faith is the death and the resurrection of Jesus, but it is tied to this Passover Exodus story because the weekend that Jesus died and rose again was Passover. The night before his death, the night he was rejected, uh, betrayed by his own follower, that night they were having dinner celebrating the Passover, telling the story of the Exodus, and Jesus said something that is of paramount importance to understand all of scripture. He said, all this Passover stuff finds its fulfillment in me. 
I'm the fulfillment of everything that this was about. It's all now found in me, which is why we are followers of Jesus and we're not Jewish people. Now, what the Apostle Paul says, and this is someone who now lives in response and faith to Jesus. Uh, he hated Christians and he became one and he started planting the church, churches and he changed the world. He's an awesome guy. He tells us, and this is what we looked at last week in 1 Corinthians 10, that this story of the Passover, this Exodus story, was written down for you and I still, as followers of Jesus, as an example for us to learn from and as warning signs to us if we don't. And so we must look back at this story and the mistakes that they made so that you and I can avoid making them in our, in our lives. Now, last week we talked about complaining. It was just a warm up to what we're doing today, all right? Last week, complaining, like, hey, we all get it, we all mess up, we probably complain like 50 sometimes this week, and we have a lot of grace for ourselves when we see us mess up. We know it's not right, but like, we have grace. What we're gonna talk about today, I am telling you, you're not gonna like at least some part of this. And, and, and this is one of those moments, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you get a pass. You can ignore me for the next few minutes and just learn about us crazy Christians. But at the center of what God calls us to is a radical form of living, and it is not what comes natural, and I'm telling you, you're not gonna like it. If you're new to church, this might feel like, like graduate level Jesus stuff. You're like, I didn't know that was part of the package. It just relax, give yourself grace. Those of us who've been following Jesus for a long time, we still mess this up. But you will want, legit, like complaining, we can all see it and get it. As we talk about this today, I'm telling you, you're gonna want to see this in other people and not in yourself. And, and when you do see it in yourself, you are going to want to justify your participation in this attitude and you're gonna want your situation to be the exclusion from this. Today, what I wanna show you is that we're not called to live these lives and all keep trying to be the exclusions to this stuff, but rather to live in subjection to some things. And so the problem we're gonna talk about, the attitude issue we need to address is the, the problem of rebellion. To be a rebel, what could be more American than that? Rebellion, the attitude of I won't, I know I should, but I won't, and you can't make me. <laughs> rebellion is a sin, and we'll define it this way, okay, because Again, th there's part of this sermon where I feel like I'm gonna pull a pin and like roll a hand grenade into your life and just blow some stuff up and I'm not gonna be able to fix it. I'm not gonna be able to answer all the questions for you, okay? I can only today for this window talk about the big principles, the broad strokes. You'll want me to be more specific and I won't be able to, so you're gonna have to do some extra work. You're gonna have to dig into these chapters of the Bible this week and let God speak to you through them. You might need to buy that book and read it. You might need to buy some other books. You might need to set up a time to meet with a pastor. You might need to get in a room with a counselor. There might be some very real next steps you need to take. But today we're just gonna talk in broad strokes, all right? So just stick with me. It's the kind of sermon that like as a pastor, when I'm talking about this and halfway through someone gets up to just like go to the bathroom, I just assume they're angry. All right, so we'll just assume anybody who gets up for the next couple of minutes, you just gotta go to the bathroom, all right? Um, <laughs> if you're mad, I'm sorry, stick with me. All right, anyway, back to this. Rebellion is this. Rebellion is rejection or resistance of proper authority, okay? Proper meaning it has to be defined, meaning it has limits. But when we rebel against proper authority, there is a deeper issue happening, Scripture points us to, that is a rejection of God himself and the authorities he has established in our life. I told you, we're not gonna like it. Here we go. The Apostle Paul writes to a group of Christians living in Rome under persecution, under a very morally corrupt empire and government system. Hear his words, Romans chapter 13, verse one. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. He's repeating it in case it wasn't clear. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So Paul is saying here that God has established some authorities in this world and it's not just his authority, but it's those that he's given authority to and we're called to be in subjection to them all. Now, what are they? There are five of them that the Bible talks about. You can read more about them in Romans 13, in 1 Peter 2 that we're gonna get to in a couple of minutes, in, in chapters like Ephesians chapter five. Here are the five authorities God has put in place that we are to live in subjection to. The first is human governments. See, the story of scripture moves from a group of people out of a garden 
to being nomads, to being a people group that ultimately in eternity, all God's people live in a city. We are this, this movement of being nomads to being a civilization and to being a society. That's what eternity will be like. And governments were put in place by God to organize us as imperfect as they are, placed there by God. Here's the second one, church leadership. Third, our fathers over their homes. The fourth, our parents over their children. And the last one, our bosses over their employees. Jesus calls us to live a radical kind of life because he's invited us into a relationship that allows us to disconnect from the human brokenness, meaning we can find restoration and reconciliation with our creator through Jesus, which means our worth, our value, our identity have all already been stated, right? Like any product in an economy, its worth is determined by how far people are willing to go and how much they're willing to pay for it. So the story of God and the story of you is how far God was willing to go and how much he was willing to pay for you. Your worth, your identity is his sons and daughters created in his image was forever set on a cross. Nothing can change that. And therefore you and I, as we follow him and truly understand who he is and his authority, we don't have to look to any human institution or any human relationship to define for us our worth, our value, our security, or be a source of healing to us. Because we know who is in charge, we can live under the humans and the systems God has placed in charge. So understand, authority from God is an umbrella. He's the one in charge. But he has placed some some institutions, some things that we are to live subject to. And, And just like that umbrella, you don't have to live under it. He's just saying, you step outside of that and there are some storms in life that are gonna hit you upside the head. There will be consequences to it. So, If you have your Bible, let's turn to number 16. Let's read about this attitude problem in the Exodus story, and then we'll jump to 1 Peter and see the solution. We're gonna start in verse one. We're gonna read a bunch of weird ancient Jewish names. Ready? Here we go. Number 16. Korah, son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and certain Reubenites, Dathan and Abram, sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, became insolent and rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. The whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? Now, if you know the story, Moses never would set himself up above other people. He didn't want to be the leader. Every time God said, you're the man, he's like, no, 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 pick someone else. There's got to be someone more qualified. And here this group of people come rebelling against the authority of Moses, God's chosen person to lead his people. And what you find in the story is the same as us. It's all birthed out of a bunch of half-truths, half-conversations, misassumptions and mistrust, never constructive face-to-face conversations that seek reconciliation. They're like, oh, the whole community is holy. No, they're not. They're just called and set apart to be, but they're not all holy. And yet God was with them, but that's not the point, nor is it a license for the rebellion that ensues. Now, you have to read this whole story, and the consequences are severe. But the mistake they're making in this moment, you and I still make to this day. We mistake equality for sameness. Equality, see, at the foot of the cross, we all have equality, men and women, young and old. We have the same equality, like God sees us the same, our value and our worth, it's the same, but it doesn't mean we have the same kind of callings or the same kind of life or the same kind of skills. Equality exists, but some of us will have lives that are easier. Some of us will struggle in ways that are unfair and unjust and different, Some of us have been gifted in different ways. It's what makes the diversity and the beauty of the body of Christ. We have equality, but not sameness. And so in this moment, they're saying we're equals, therefore we deserve the same authority you have, and they were wrong. In fact, maybe a different way to explain it and how we mess it up still is we think equality should equal fairness. It can't. It just can't exist this side of heaven. There'll never be fairness. When you read the gospel stories, Jesus, they're all equal, but he only lets 12 be his closest disciples and three of them his like best friends. That's not fair, but they're equal. He didn't speak about their worth or value. He still died on the cross for them. Jesus will go into situations and heal one like disabled person and not a bunch of others. 
That's not fair, but it doesn't speak to their equality or worth. It's important in understanding the story. So as you read the story, there's a number of things that became the source of their rebellion, and, and I think you'll be able to relate. What we saw there in verse three is what we'll call jealousy. They were jealous, and they wanted his position of authority, even though they had not been called to it, nor done the work or respected the process that got Moses where he was. Jealousy breeds rebellion and resistance of God's proper authority in our life. Uh, you keep reading the story. Again, you gotta read it yourself. Verse four, we see delusions. They, they are not seeing themselves clearly. They, and you and I, we can be guilty of this. We are good at self-deception. And we cannot see our giftings and our abilities clearly. And when we're not really clear of who we are, we can start thinking we should be other people. That we should have other positions of authority. If we're not careful, that will breed rebellion. When you get to verse nine in the story, you see ungratefulness at the heart of this. I mean, God had blessed them. God was with them. God had done amazing things like part red seas, but they were focused on what they didn't have. And that ungratefulness for them became a reason to rebel. In verse 12, you see a stubbornness at the heart of the story. Moses is, is humble. Again, he didn't want to be the leader anyway. So he's like, maybe I'm a bad leader. And God's like, nope, you just got a bunch of bad followers. Sorry. And they're not rejecting you, Moses. They're rejecting me. So Moses says to these guys like, hey, come, let's talk and have a conversation like adults to which they say stubbornly, nope. We've already indicted you. We've already decided. We've already rejected you. Feel familiar to a situation you've ever been in in life or maybe you've been the source of in your life? Stubbornness. An unwillingness to be constructive and reconcile, man, it leads to rebellion. Then in verse 13, we see disappointment. Part of what was breeding this rebellion and rejection of Moses, they were disappointed. You and I, when life's not going the way we want, we, we tend to blame the leaders and authority over us. And sometimes this life just doesn't go good. And it might even be legitimate for them. It might have been a legitimate disappointment, but for them it became an excuse to abandon the responsibility to be good followers, and they rebelled. And then verse 14, we see distrust. It's, it's humorous because Moses is like, no, let's come talk and be adults. And they're like, no, if we come, you'll gouge our eyes out. And you're like, where'd that come from? Like Moses wasn't, guilty. he's guilty of some anger problems. But he'd never gouge anybody's eyes out in the story. So you're like, what a weird, blanketed, demonizing, mistrusting thing to say, to be stubborn and mistrusting leads to rejection of the proper authority that God has placed over us in life. Ultimately, what's so important about this story to pay attention to is this. Moses isn't perfect, but he does have God on his side. He's not a perfect leader. He messes up in a ton of ways in the story, but that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that God had placed Moses in a position of authority, and God was behind him, and to reject him was to reject God, and it came with grave consequences. And for you and I, ultimately, if we choose to live our life with a rebellious kind of attitude, we will be choosing to live our life wandering in the wilderness like they did, wandering around and never arriving at the fullness and the beauty and the maturity of where Jesus is calling us to. We can miss the depth of it, the blessing it's supposed to be. So what's the solution? The solution is one word. You won't like it. We'll read it first from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter five, verse 21, he says it like this, submit. Can you think of a less American word? <laughs> submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Because of who we are in submission to, the Lord of our life, we can live in submission to other people. Out of our reverence for him, we are people who can choose a submissive attitude and lifestyle. So open up to 1 Peter 2. We're gonna start in verse 13. And we're gonna walk through him leading us through the implications and how to apply this to our lives. Here's the first thing we see, is that submission is a duty to God. I know I already said that in a different way, but like to reject the authority God has put over you in life is to reject God. So there's a duty for every one of us who follow Jesus to live in submission to those authorities that he has placed over us. Now we don't like that. We like to see rebellion in light of some jerk person or some bad boss or some broken system. You and I, too often, we focus on the frail imperfections of our leaders, and we use that as an excuse to dismiss our responsibility to be submissive in life. We can't control other people and their mistakes and the dumb things they will do, and they will do more of them. But I have a responsibility, and you have a responsibility as a follower of Jesus to choose this attitude and heart of submission. 
So here's what Peter says, verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as supreme authority. <laughs> we gotta stop there. Like that, that can't hit us in the way it hit those people then. In the first century readers, you're talking about the emperor? You mean Nero? You mean a dude who sees himself as like a demigod? A guy who could not be more pagan, more opposed to the things of Jesus, who is trying to kill us and has probably killed people we know? You're saying live in submission to that kind of evil? The only way this can even close, it's not close, but be close to impacting us in the same way, read that, but replace the word emperor with Donald Trump or Barack Obama, whichever one you like least. And then it still won't hit you at the magnitude of what he's saying. Every human authority, not some of them, not the good ones, not the ones you like or the ones you agree with, submit to them. Now stay with me. Some of you are starting to check out, I know. Submission is a choice we make. It's something we offer up, not because human authority deserves it, not because it affirms us or everything we want, but because we believe in the one who is ultimately authority, and in following him, we choose to be submissive. S submissive, submission is a military term. And it, and it just simply means to just understand yourself in a chain of command. It's about seeing yourself clearly. It's about knowing who you are and who you're not. Submission is not about weakness. It's actually about learning the term and the word meek. It's about meekness. God has not called us to be submissive, weak people who are the doormat of the world who can just run over us. That's not our worth, our value. But in all that we are and who he says we are, to understand the meekness, which is power under restraint. The best kind of picture is picture a Clydesdale horse. The biggest, baddest horse on the planet. So powerful, so amazing, so beautiful. And yet that power and strength is in submission to its authority. In two seconds, it could overpower that old man. But it's meek, it's not weak. This is the way to understand submission that God is calling us to. Because we know the one who's ultimately in authority, we can live under authority. A person in authority over us cannot demand or command submission from us. They can command us to obey them. But submission is only given. Submission is a choice, like every attitude. It can't be forced down, it's a bottom up kind of thing. And I wanna say this, if you're a young person in this room or you have aspirations to be a greater leader than you are today, know this, you will never be a great leader if you can't be a really great follower. God will not trust you with more authority in your life if you can't live under authority. It's how he designed it, it's the system, submit to it, trust it. And God is saying it's, it's a calling that he has on you. It's a duty that you owe him as he's the one who's in authority. So here's the second thing, we'll keep going. We've only gotten one verse done, I know. Second thing Peter gives us, submission brings protection from God. There's a, a, a principle, a proverb echoed all throughout scripture, which is that you will reap what you sow in this life. What you do, you will get back. Rebellion begets more rebellion. Anger and resentment will just bring more anger and resentment in your life. The only thing that changes it is to break the cycle and do something different. It, it, it's actually wrapped up in this concept of humility. If you want God to protect you, you must learn to respond in a way that's different and learn to trust God's providence more than you trust your leadership's authority. Learn to trust God's timing and obey him and follow him more than you trust your opinion and your judgment of a situation of a human or of an institution. So here's where he goes next, verse 14. So first he says, every human authority starts with the emperor, that's the worst one, and he keeps going, verse 14. Or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. God's established authority over you to protect you like an umbrella, and then he's calling you and I to use a submissive attitude, an understanding of the strength of our meekness to silence the talk of foolish people. It's not just to protect us from, from the consequences of rebellion, it's even to protect us from false accusations. That when people come against us with something that they hold against us, they'll find nothing because we are submissive and meek people. 
And, and like I said, this boils down to humility. God's very clear that he will lift up the humble, protect the humble, and he will teach you lessons if you're proud. So humility is learning to realize that when you're wronged, you're not better than that person that wronged you. Humility is, is learning to understand that though leadership in this life will fail, you're not better than those people. In fact, you've probably never done those jobs and you'd probably mess it up just as bad, maybe even worse. Humility approaches it from that perspective. Humility chooses to love and not be proud. It chooses to extend grace and mercy. And Jesus was really clear. Think of how much grace and mercy you wanna receive in your life. You better give it. I think in my life, I want a lot of grace and a lot of mercy. I do a lot of dumb things. That means I better get really good at being someone who gives a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of mercy to people around me. So this humility stuff is learning to wait on God's timing and not take action into our own hands, trusting and obeying him. The author of the book, Lord, Change My Attitude Before It's Too Late, his name's James McDonald, he says this. Here's the underlying problem. You're too focused on human authority. Behind that person is God, and if you pridefully resist that person's authority, God himself will oppose you. Now, this is not to say that there are not times and are not situations where we need to humbly resist improper authority. This might be the very part you've been waiting for me to get to. Hey, doesn't this have limits? And yes, it does. This is where Peter gets to. Submission has limits under God. We all kind of have a knee-jerk reaction when we start talking about submission to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. This can be misapplied, this can be misused, this is dangerous. And you're right. It has been misused, it has been abused. That doesn't mean we don't need to learn from it, and it doesn't mean we don't need to grow in it. It just means we need to recognize its limits. Submission has limits under God. All right, verse 16, here's where Peter goes next. He says this, live as free people, but don't use your freedom to cover up evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. He's saying you have the freedom because of the cross, freedom to be uh, forgiven, freedom, but now we choose to live as slaves to God and no one else. We are called to live free, not as slaves to any institution or to any person, which means there are limits to submission. It means there, you're never locked in or stuck in something that is an improper use of authority. It doesn't mean we don't address it. God says we're called to live free, but only because we see ourselves as owned by, as slaves of, as in the service of our Lord Jesus. So kids, you're not a slave to your parents. You are called to live in submission to them, but you are a slave to Christ. Wives, you are not a slave to your husband, but you are to Christ. Employees, you are not a slave to your boss or to your company, but you are to Christ. It means he's the boss, and if Jesus says jump, we say how high. He's in charge. But if there are limits, then the question becomes, when is there too much submission? This is where you would love for me to get really specific and talk about your thing that you're struggling with or trying to decipher through. I can't do that, so I'm gonna give you some principles to guide the conversation. Here's how you understand the limits. Two things. First, how much injustice are you called to bear up under in this life? Now, I don't know for you. I just know, I can bet that it's more than you want. <laughs> we always want life to be easier. We always want life to be fair and convenient and simple and pain-free. It's not. There's quite a bit of injustice we're called to bear up, bear up under. But the second is then deciphering when is injustice abuse and need to be dealt with, okay? Let me give you three ways to kind of process that. Three ways to consider as you decipher this. The first is this. Consider the source of the injustice, the severity of the injustice, and the frequency of the injustice. To decipher two, through those two things, you need to think of the source. The source meaning like the relationship. Think of the relationship you have with whatever that thing is or that person. That, that commitment like in a marriage is different than in a boss-employee relationship, which means there's things you'll tolerate in a marriage that's not fair or unjust, that's totally different and you would not in an employee-boss relationship. All right, so you think of the source, then you think of the severity. Say you're in a work relationship and you've got the kind of boss who's passive aggressive, who slanders and gossips about you behind your back, who you know has withheld some promotions that you earned, that you deserve, that's unjust. 
But that is, that is on the severity scale, while unjust, is not the same as like a spouse who's being verbally or physically abusive. So severity has to be considered in the conversation. And then the third part is frequency, right? A, a spouse who loses their temper and says something they shouldn't have to the kids one time in 15 years is not the same as someone who does that one time a day. So source, severity, and frequency need to be considered in the process. Again, I can't answer all of your questions on that, but I do just wanna say, to hear me clearly, if you are a spouse in an abusive situation, physically or even verbally, you do need to be safe, and you do need to get some help before you leave here today. Now, I'm not saying run from your marriage. I have seen God redeem some very broken, messed up situations, but I am saying you do need to be safe. And way too often, one spouse will say, I'm just enduring it for the kids, but you have a responsibility to protect that extends beyond your capacity to endure. And that applies to, to workspace situations as well. Again, maybe you just need to talk to a pastor before you leave today. In the book, the author says this. He says, God desires wise, proactive submission, not slavery or ignorance from us. So recognize that submission has limits. And then Peter keeps going. And it gets tougher. Next, he teaches us this, that submission promises favor from God. God, God talks about how he loves a willful, humble heart. He calls us to it and he loves us for it. Here's what he says next. Peter says this, verse 18, slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters. Hold the phone. Everyone should feel uncomfortable every time we come to these verses. Now, here's what we wish Jesus did. We wish he entered the world and fixed the whole thing. He didn't. He entered the world and he came to redeem human hearts, not systems. He came to enter and change lives, not the whole world at one time. All right, so we, as people whose hearts have been changed, can work against the oppressive injustice systems, but Jesus came along to redeem hearts, not systems, and what's amazing is we now, as a society, not just Christians, can look at a verse like that, and we know humans should never own humans. Now, that wasn't true then, and what the gospel did was said, because of your worth and your value, you can live under and bear up under injustices, so listen to what it says. Slaves live in reverent fear of God. Submit yourselves to your masters, not only those who are good and considerate, but also those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under pain, the pain of unjust suffering, because they are conscious of, jo of God. B because how we react and act in this life doesn't just reflect on us, but on the one we believe is king. So because of Jesus, Peter is saying, that you and I can bear up under injustices in this life and suffer and be made better for it. I know you don't like it. That's the truth. It means that, that like in a work relationship, if you don't get recognized and get the credit for all the achievements and the energy that you put into it, God still got you. He'll take care of you. It means if you have a boss who keeps putting a lid on your leadership, God's got you, he sees you, and your trust doesn't need to be in that person or that institution, but in him. It means if you're in a relationship where you feel underappreciated, God's got you. If you feel like you live under a government system that is morally corrupt, God's saying, hey, I've got you. I'm the one in charge, not them. So don't confuse it. You can suffer with a purpose in this life. And God's inviting you to see that, that you can bear up under the unfairness and the injustices of your life and suffer well and grow well and become made someone better than you would be without those things which leads to the last thing Peter's gonna show us. And here he's gonna lay it on really thick. The last thing he shows us is that submission cultivates intimacy with God. Do you wanna get closer to God? Do you wanna feel a depth in your relationship with God? What if I told you it's just coming into this concept and living out this submissive principle? Not just to God, but to all the human authorities that he's placed over you in your life. Do you know why? Because to live in submission to the human authorities God has placed over you, you're gonna have to depend on him a lot more and trust him a whole lot more and come to him and talk to him a whole lot more because it will grow you and mature you unlike any other thing you will go through in your life. So read with me Peter's words. And I want you to recognize this, especially you Christians. We love to quote some of these verses we're about to read, but we do not ever quote them in context. Very clearly, he's talking about submission and suffering with the purpose. Now, hear what he says. 
Start in verse 21, Peter says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, had no deceit, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He bore, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to our sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the overseer, the shepherd and the overseer of your souls to the one who is authority. And there has been a very clear example marked out for you that when they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. I don't know about you, but I messed that up a lot. That when they brought their accusations towards him, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. God is saying because of what Jesus is and what those of us who follow him believe he is, we are called to live radically different lives that are in submission to him. Because Jesus suffered, we can suffer. We can submit for the sake of others. Because what we do and what we say in this life are a reflection of the hope and the beauty and the truth we believe to be bigger than any government and any misused authority or leadership. And that when people see you and I respond in grace and not spite, when they see us live out lives of humility, not prideful resistance, we put on display the power of the gospel. Submission is what the good news of Jesus looks like when we live it out in an evil, imperfect, broken world. It's the calling that all of us have as we follow Jesus.